It's the Hero Show. Welcome to the Hero Show, everybody, where every week we, we seek inspiration from great men and women to become the heroes or heroines of our own lives. And you are here with your hosts. I am Andrew Bernstein. You are Robert Begley. How are you doing this week, Robert? Hola, Andres. Estoy emocionado de celebrar la vida de la primera superestrella del ah, béisbol man. latino. You can, you can tell this dude from the Bronx. Uh, That's true. So, so I'm excited to be say, here. Uh, <laughs> I'm excited to be here to celebrate the life of the first Latin American superstar in baseball. And you can tell everybody who that is, Andy. Yo, know, that was the great Roberto Clemente, who's got the same first name, you know, as... As, as, as a kid, he was the first... I could tell you that as a kid, that was the first time I ever saw somebody with my name, but it was spelled with an additional letter. So he's been a big part of my life, Andy, as, as long as I can remember. And uh, I think one of the themes for today is Clemente challenged the status quo of the major leagues and uh, what do you feel like in, in your own life? What do you, have you ever felt like everybody's against you? Well, we're, we're going to start with three different points that I'd like to address, Andy. Number one is the issue of racism, because he started with what they call two strikes against him. He was black and he was Puerto Rican, and that caused some definite problems. Right, and this is and the year when the the year was when he breaks into Major League Baseball. The, the year was nineteen fifty four or fifty five. Okay, so it's mid fifties. Jackie Robinson had broken the color barrier not that many years before. This the most most of the players, even in the National League, which became integrated before the American League, uh, still most players were white. Uh, so, some of the players, some of the fans, were still you know prejudiced against black players and. Clemente's Latino on top of it speaks Spanish and not English. So that's that was the second strike against him. You, you say, right? Yeah. So if in baseball terms, you only get three strikes and he already had two against him. Uh, the second one is suppose you there you have a skill and you practice day and night and you master this skill. Should you feel proud of yourself? And is, is that pride going to rub off on rub people the wrong way? If you have like a healthy ego, is that good? That's the second question. And then the third one, Andy, is you and I love athletes, but do we consider them heroes? You know, should they be considered heroes? If so, why? This idea of racism and uh, you're in a new country, okay, United States, your, your co-workers, meaning the players on your team, the competition, and even the sports reporters, they don't really understand you. They don't embrace you. So you, you're kind of a loner. And how do you deal with this kind of uh, opposition? So, so you're in this position, you're Clemente or somebody even today, it's easy to claim victimhood. It's, it's easy to say, you know what, I didn't, give the, I didn't get the breaks because I was black or I was Latin. But no, he is driven. Clemente is driven. Uh, because in Puerto Rico, uh, he saw, first of all, he played as a kid with um, with Blacks. Monty Irvin, uh, one of the first Black players in ma Major League Baseball, kind of took Clemente under his wing. And he played with men when he was a teenager. He just studied his craft over and over again. And he did something that is a popular expression today. He became so good that they couldn't ignore him. And eventually the players the media and the fans came around. And that that is one way that you attack this idea of racism. You go beyond color. And he says, I don't see color. I see people. I see individuals. And you have the free will. You have the choice that Clemente took to pursue, to give full effort towards uh, his success and not sit back and become a victim. You have this skill. You have this passion you're in love with. And you spend hours daily fine-tuning it and becoming elite uh, like a Clemente. You become elite in that uh, profession. Should you be proud? Should you have what we'll call like a healthy ego? Now, in sadly, in the culture, many call the ego the enemy of good. And it's, you know, they want you to sacrifice your ego. But what Clemente would say, you see this uniform? He says, when I put on that uniform, nobody is better than me. 
I mean, that, that is, uh, is this macho? Is this being macho Latino? No, no, he was proud. He certainly was proud of his heritage. And like you said, even with, with the DiMaggio comparison, Andy, he was, he was fighting for an entire nation uh, Puerto Rico, or, or actually Commonwealth, but also just the, the Caribbean and the Latin American, the broader uh, culture. He was fighting for that. But um, yes, yeah, it's, it's fascinating the way it's very similar to the way 20 years earlier, Joe D. DiMaggio felt he was fighting for the Italian immigrants. You know, it's, 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 it's fascinating how, how, how that how that repeated it. Yeah, well, one contrast, Andy, is true that and we could even stay sticking with baseball. Uh, we could even say um, Hank Greenberg uh, as the first Jewish oh, yeah, right. superstar yeah. it felt he was right. hitting hit, the, hitting home runs right. and it was Hitler's head that he was swinging That's the bat right. at, you know? That's because I mean, it was in the 1930s. It was in the 1930s, 1930s when Jewish Greenberg player. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right, right. But, it, yeah. but in Hitler's tremendous... Head. Hitler's head. That's not funny, but it is, but it is funny. <laughs> We wish he did it, you know, but it, but the yeah. one slight difference here, Andy, is that the Italian immigrants were in America and Clemente, yeah, they spoke the language. one reason they spoke the language, they spoke right? the language and that, yeah. in Clemente's uh, point. This is international. Now, this is one reason baseball is such an international sport is it's off the mainland of the U.S. So that's where I, I feel like, yeah, this this guy, you know, it's, it's incredible. Just staying with this idea of this pride and ego. He felt like there's like a famous uh, quote. He says, if the if the ball is in the park and I am on the field, I will make the play, you know, and the game is on the line. He's like, there's a term in sports called clutch. And that means when the mounting pressure is on you, you either choke or you succeed or you do something somewhat in, in the middle. And Clemente was what we call clutch which will dovetail into our third uh, point that we want to talk about in a minute. But just, I felt like Andy, this, this, this healthy ego that this man had, the way he dressed, the way he composed himself. He was like, I, I know who I am. I'm, I'm very comfortable in my own skin. And it's a matter of you all coming around uh, to meet me because I, I'm, I know who I am. This is what I love about sports, Robert. They say that for these guys, the game, the, these clutch guys, they, they, whoever, these slow heartbeat guys, as they put it, they they stay calm. That the game slows down for them in these big moments. They they live they live for the white hot spotlight of Broadway. That some people just I don't know they shy away. No, no. But Clemente Clemente thrived under the under the white hot spotlights. You know, one thing that that comes to my mind is how hard these guys work you know, to get to the top. Doesn't matter how much talent you're born with. There's a lot of talented people who don't do anything with, with their lives. And this is physically or intellectually. I mean, I know a lot of really, really, really smart people who could do God knows what if they drove themselves to develop their talent, whether in literature or science or music or whatever. It's the same thing in sports. There's a lot of guys, you know, men or women, who are really, you know, have great athletic ability. But if you want to get to be Roberto Clemente, you work your little butt off. I mean, the great Jerry Rice, one of the greatest football players in history. He was legendary for doing his eight-hour workouts every day. It was just brutal, you know. And he, and, uh, Jerry Rice had a term that I think I'd like to see gain more currency in the culture, and that is you put in the sweat equity, as he put it. Isn't that a nice, nice thing? You put in the sweat equity. You put in the work. He did it. You know, Clemente did it. Michael Jordan, they was known in the NBA. He was the hardest working superstar in the NBA. That's that is, is enormously laudable. I mean, we got to salute that kind of work ethic. And it's enormously inspirational. Because I don't have, you know, Roberto Clemente's ath athletic ability, you know, I don't have the genius of an Einstein, you know, or, you know, the literary mastery of a Shakespeare. Don't, some, some of these guys would like the goat, you know, the greatest of all time. But I have some degree of talent. Yeah, we all do. We all healthy human beings have some degree of talent. We all have a, you know, if we're healthy, we have a human brain, you know, a healthy human brain. How much can I accomplish in my life if I work in the field I love as hard as Roberto Clemente worked in the field that he loved? So that that is the reason, that's the main reason I think why, uh, 
why we can really look up to great athletes as heroes. And then related to that, the second reason is these clutch guys. You know, under pressure, it's hard to it's hard to do anything effectively. Pressure just makes you tighten up. And these guys who can handle pressure like that, and it's similar like some great singer, you know, on the Broadway stage, and she's out there, or he, as the case may be, you know, Julie Andrews, let's say. Comes to comes to mind, and you're out there, you know, on Broadway in front of thousands of people. You know, they talk about the white hot spotlights of Broadway. Uh, you're out there for the whole world to see the flop, you know, or succeed. A lot of people don't want to do it. I know a lot of people in my life; they're behind the scenes guys, and I understand that they don't, they don't want it. But it's hard. At some point in our lives, we all face pressure of certain kind. And these people who can perform under pressure the way Clemente did, that's also enormously, uh, that's, that's also, that, that's enormously praiseworthy and, and tremendously inspirational. So I think for both those re two related reasons, I think we can properly look up to these great athletes, who, and especially the ones who perform so well under pressure as heroes. Uh, piggybacking on your point is that the being clutch and, and celebrating these, you know, when they do these things, it makes me want to be better at what I do. Okay. There was a sports writer who Clemente did not like early in his life. It was, it was mutual. He would make fun of Clemente later in his life. The sports writer said, watching him do what he do, does every day on the baseball field makes me want to write like Shakespeare. Okay, so that's exactly your point. Right. This guy wants to be, in as a sports writer, he wants to be like a Shakespeare because he gets to watch a Shakespeare on the field every single day, and it's his job to put that put his experience down in writing. So these are reasons, certainly, why <clears throat> the heroism. Then the other point, Andy, is little kids. Okay, my first first living be, uh, hero in life was Tom Seaver, pitcher on the New York Mets, okay? First game I ever went to at Shea Stadium was the Pittsburgh Pirates, and I saw Roberto Clemente. But when you're, when you're little kids, you look up to these uh, heroes, and they go and sign your autograph. Clemente would sign 20,000 autographs a year. 20,000! <laughs> That's like staggering, Andy, okay? To, so you meet them as a kid. They're going to leave an impression on you. You're going to you're going to want to grow up and be maybe not a baseball player, but be whatever that ability you have and whatever that passion is. You're not going to forget that. So I think that that heroic element also uh, dovetails into this theme. What, the, what just one thing I want to say before we close on the first segment, and it's something you already alluded to, Robert, is Clemente's greatness didn't end with his own lifetime because he, he made pass opened the door for a yes. flood of talented players from Kicked Latin the door America. Down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, batted <laughs> battered it down. That's right. And today there's so many great players that have been for years now, you know, from, from Latin America. And, and Clemente paved the way for them, the way Jackie Robinson did for so many great black players. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're watching the Hero Show brought to you by the Objective Standard Institute. Uh, you can follow us, uh, like us, uh, this episode. We want to get the word out there. Uh, we have, you can go to our website, objectivestandard.org. We have courses coming up. We have uh, other podcasts and conferences. So uh, with that, Andy, how about we switch over to Clemente's uh, biography? Right. Well, he's born in 1934 in, in Puerto Rico. Dies tragically in 1972 in a plane crash. Was he on his way to Nicaragua to, to, to provide uh, relief aid after an earthquake in Nicaragua? So, so he, he lived a very short life of 38 years. 30, 38 years, packed it all in, made every moment count, as, as the expression goes. Here we see him with his wife, Vera, and uh, I think two sons, Roberto and Enrique. A real family man, uh, grows up in Puerto Rico, uh, Catalina, it's uh, just south of San Juan, more inland. And he's um, he's fascinated by sports. He's athletic. He works out in the field. The, the, the family wasn't really poor, but the country was. So he had to work for everything he got. So already as a kid, he's got a good work ethic. And when he's like 12 years old, Andy, there's a car crash and 
somebody's in the car and the car starts on fire. Clemente goes in and pulls out the injured person and saves their life. Okay. So, so here's the man values human life. Okay. As, as a good example, uh, when he's, um, 18, he start he gets signed a professional sports uh, contract, making 40 bucks a, uh, a week playing in Puerto Rico. He always played with older people. I'd mentioned uh, Monty Irvin. Um, and Andy, one way he got his strong arm, he would throw the javelin. He almost made it to the Olympics. Uh, it, it, javelin throw, yeah. So, because the other thing is, not only did he have a strong arm, he had laser precision uh aim you know i mean he could throw a ball 300 feet right on target i've never seen anybody do something like that my lasting image of roberto clemente because i was a yankee fan i was you know watching the american league games there were no winter league games back then so i didn't get to see clemente play that often but i did see him play you know uh you know on tv a few times against the mets uh in the in the all-star game uh in the world series and my last, I don't even remember what game it was, or who they were playing, who the Pirates were playing, but to take a ball off the wall, the right field corner, and then whirl at one motion, fire a, a dart to third base on the fly, you know, dead on target, like you said, to third baseman's glove. What's good was catch, drop the tag, and the base runner's out trying to, you know, trying to go from, you know, trying to trying to stretch a, a double into a triple. Uh, yeah, Clemente had the greatest throwing arm I've ever seen in Major League Baseball, ever. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And so does Vince Scully, the famous uh, baseball announcer who died a few weeks ago at age 100. He said Clemente could pick up the ball in New York and throw out a base runner in Pennsylvania. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a bit hard <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But right, right. i kind of love speak, the hyperbole that baseball yeah. and the tall tales that baseball lends itself to i love that story. <laughs> so we get to the 1950s uh 54 the brooklyn dodgers are interested and they actually sign him they give him like a ten thousand dollar uh signing bonus to come play with their team now they didn't exactly want him to play they knew he was a, a raw talent but they didn't want the new york giants to get him because the giants had bully mays who was an incredible outfielder and the two of them andy imagine a clemente and mays in your outfield you wouldn't even need a left fielder i mean with the two of them it would be yeah, like well, why, don't, why don't we yeah well why don't we sign hank aaron while we're at it Put him in the outfield. yeah <laughs> so don't. good point good point because the braves the milwaukee braves also wanted him and bidded for him and then eventually uh, Branch Rickey, the man who changed baseball uh, twice, who first took Jackie Robinson, at th in this era, Branch Rickey was with the Pittsburgh Pirates, and he found a way to get uh, Clemente. And the Pirates were a sad sack team. They had, so this is 1955. They had not even been in the World Series in, in, since 1925. Calvin Coolidge was the president. They were laughing stock. Yeah, thirty yeah, years. And they, and they weren't. And they weren't a 500 team. They were. They were sub 500 almost were, every almost every season. Yes. They weren't even. Yeah, a they were. They're awful. So Clemente comes, and he's lonely, like we mentioned earlier. Uh, no, he didn't. This is one reason he signed so many autographs. He would just stay out out in the field signing because he really he was homesick. He didn't um, he didn't really relate to the other players to the to the media and certainly the the opponents didn't like him. Uh, we see a picture here with his wife and, and kids. It it took him about ten years actually in in the major leagues to to uh, meet her and marry her. This is. Uh, uh, the picture there, but um, but the Pirates start playing him, and it takes them five years, Andy. 1960, they go from this laughing stock. Five years later, they're playing the big, bad Yankees, okay, with who you mentioned, Mickey, Mickey Mantle, uh, Roger Maris, Yogi Berra, Whitey Ford. The Yankees had already won like tw more than 20 World Series. So it was David versus Goliath in 1960. And mm -hmm. the way the series went, the Yankees would win like 17 to 1, <laughs> 18 to 2, and the Pirates would win 2 to 1 and 3 to 2, these close games. So we get to a game seven 
Andy, why don't, why don't you? Uh, <laughs> I think you. I think you know how that one ended. But uh... yeah, it's, it was it was a fascinating World Series. It was the first World Series that that I watched. I was a Yankee fan. Uh, the the um, Yankees outscored the Pirates in the seven game series by a, a ton of runs. Uh, by the by the way, Whitey Ford pitched two shutouts in that World Series, ten nothing and twelve nothing. And Bob Turley won the third game. The Yankees won sixteen to three. You're right, the Yankees killed them in those three games, and the Pirates won four very close one like one run games. And and game seven in Pittsburgh, Bill Mazeroski was not you know a home run hit. It comes up against. Ralph Terry, Yankees pitcher, who, uh, yeah, uh, uh, I think it was Ralph Terry was pitching and hit, and hit it up, you know, over the left field wall, and then the Pirates won the game and the series 10-9. Uh, that, that, but this was, um, yeah, this was like this was a class. The Yankees outscored them by like thirty some by like thirty runs, you know, for the over the over the seventy games. But yeah, the Pirates were a, a plucky, gutty, talented team, and and the. Uh, uh, did Mazeroski win the MVP? Yeah, clutch. Did Mazeroski win the MVP for that series? Yeah, I, yes. I, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure he did. Um, uh, was it right? Was it, who was the second baseman? Crosby won the MVP for the league. Um, Mazeroski on Pirates. Was, was their second. Mazeroski okay, I think was it was the, thir the third baseman. Uh, I can't remember his name now. I think it was uh, Crosby. Anyway, so um, so after the series, the celebration. Even Clemente doesn't know how to celebrate because ever you know he's kind of withdrawn. He goes out into the um, to out <laughs> onto the streets, okay, to be with the fans. He kind of felt more like a fan than 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 a player at that moment. And people see him and they're crowding around him, and he's finally getting some amount of adulation. And the reason I right. mentioned the uh, again Crosby, I apologize for not having this uh, perfectly, but that. Player won the MVP for the year, 1960. And Clemente had twice the number of runs batted in and just had a better year all around. And he came in seventh place in the voting. And he was astonished. He's like, are you kidding me? We're the champs and I'm number seven, these other players. So he already started to attract some bad publicity because he's complaining. Now, yeah. one of the criticisms, Andy, of uh, Clemente is that he would always complain. Uh, you know, bad back, this and that. And he got into a car crash in 1954 and, and hurt his neck and his back. And that's why whenever you'd see him, he'd always be, be he had the proverbial, you know, rotating his, his neck before going to bat. But when people would ask, how are you feeling? He, he was so honest, Andy. Like the traditional answer is, yeah, I'm good. You know, he'd say, no, my back hurts. You know, my shoulder hurts. And it's like, no, man, you're yeah. complaining. You're turning into a complaint. Yeah, right. Yeah. Then, then he'd go out. Then he'd go out and go three for four, you know, That's in the true. game and throw, some, yeah. throw somebody out on the bases. But, you know, I, you yes. know complaining it, it shouldn't be a big deal. So, somebody performs when they're hurt, you know. So you know what yes. comes to mind when we talk about complaining, Robert, from sports was the great Will Chamberlain, one of the greatest players in NBA yes. history. Oh, a sure. bunch of guys, yep. yeah, a bunch of NBA guys said, yo, yo, jokingly, Will Chamberlain never committed a foul in his entire career <laughs> because he complained. Well, complained every about every foul, yeah. Caught. Yeah. yeah, everyone. So yeah. He's a complainer, but he was a tremendous player. So you live with yeah. the complainers, you know, when they when they hold up one under pressure and two when they're hurt. You know, that's the whole thing. This victim versus victor mentality where, no, I'm, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to produce. So 1960 world champions, then the Pirates go down a, a bit again, but Clemente's star is rising. And so are these other players in the National League. And Andy, I want to switch gears talking about the National League in the 1960s. They brought in these Latinos and these Blacks that the American League was more old school and stayed with the older white players. And we kind of saw that in the 1960s, 60 World Series. And then later on when the Cardinals played the Yankees, I think 64, uh, where th the, the players in the National League were faster, stronger, more exciting. The triple in baseball is the most exciting play where you hit the ball and you run 270 feet, first, second, third base. And Clemente was the tops in the game for hitting hitting triples. And so let's talk about this idea of, you know, embracing the change 
uh, in the sport, while one, one side is embracing it, one league is embracing it, and the other staying. Uh, yeah, and, and I think I think we could be uh, harsher in the language. You said old school about the American League, which is accurate, but they, it was this is racism. I mean, they didn't want the, the, a number of the American League teams did not want black, well, you know, let, black Latino players on their team. So that was that was racism, and they and they learned the hard way. Uh, and that is your know, Branch Rickey, former. Uh, General manager Brooklyn Dodgers. He was the one who integrated uh, baseball in 1947 and, and wanted Jackie Robinson to play for the Dodgers, which which he did. And Branch Rickey recognized the injustice of you know keeping black and later on Latino players out of the league, but also recognized it was very much in the Brooklyn Dodgers' rational self interest to to integrate because you know yes they could still draw from the, the great white players, they had Duke Snyder and Gil Hodges and Carl Farillo and a whole bunch of, you know, great P, P. Wee Reese had a whole bunch of great white players on the team. But now they can bring in great black players too. And they, you know, they could bring in Jackie Robinson and Jim Gilliam and Joe Black and, and a whole bunch of, and, and, and later on, yeah, oh yeah, Roy Campanella for sure. Can't forget he's Hall of Famer, you know. Uh, and, and later on, the Latino players, you, you could you draw from a much broader talent base, uh, then you have a much better chance of competing successfully at, at this very high level. So it really shows, as it's, it's an example of how rational self-interest promotes justice, right? Rational self-interest, acting in your rational self-interest promotes the good in, in human life. And 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 this these examples of integrating baseball with first black and then with Latino many black Latino players, uh, it, it really illustrates that perfectly. So one of the things he would do, Andy, we talk about the explosion, uh, how he's responsible for the explosion of Latin uh, baseball players is he would train, coach young kids. Okay, he'd go back to Puerto Rico, take his you know capitalist creative dollars in America, go back there, finance new baseball fields and all these little uh, parks in other caribbean countries and and get the game get uh, get these young kids to learn this game so that as we said they could get off that island come to america make money and then turn around and have <clears throat> you know have their countries have more of the riches that uh, that come from america and that was a big part of clemente's life he, they now have an award called the roberto clemente award and it's for humanitarian services and and in many senses it's the good version of humanitarianism where he he wants to help he wants to improve people's lives by any means that is within his grasp he's not demanding others do this he's voluntarily taking his wealth and putting it and getting all Others, you know, getting corporations even to, to buy in to building up these uh, slum neighborhoods in uh, in Latin American countries to give them baseball, to give them hope. OK, there's another thing about Clemente is that he he just gives you hope. And, and you talk to any Latin American player and he is on that pedestal. Uh, it's like a different there's there's just a completely different mindset when they talk about other uh, Latin American players. So just a, a couple of more things. Uh, <clears throat> a lot, you know, like in recent decades, a number of black American athletes point out Jackie Robinson is the guy who made all this possible, you know, and for the Latino players, Roberto Clemente, you know, is the guy who made all this possible. And Clemente had a big heart, you know, and he was a legitimately, you wanted to help out his brothers and sisters. And like you said, get other people to voluntarily assist in this. And that's tragically how he passed away, right? 1972. Was it? Was it? Was it Christmas night or New Year's? New Year's Eve? I forget. New Year's yes, Eve, New Andy. Year's Eve. I remember the. I remember the New day Year. vividly because earlier that day, I'm a, I'm a Miami Dolphins football uh, fan, and the Dolphins beat the Steelers uh, to go to the Super Bowl. And then later on, 9 p.m., uh, Venezuela. No, uh, Nicaragua had an earthquake, and. Uh, devastation and a few months earlier clemente had managed one of the teams in nicaragua and they needed relief so he's in puerto rico and he he uses his status to charter an airplane and unfortunately the, to bring supplies to nicaragua and his wife is saying don't go his kids are saying don't go 
and they overload the plane by thousands of pounds of supplies, Andy, and it takes off and just goes right into the Caribbean, never found. I think they found one wing of the plane. The body was never discovered. It was a shock to the baseball world. It was shocked to the world, to, to the broader world as such, because by this time in his life, he had transcended baseball. He was a, he was a major public figure. And the, uh, you know, the tragedy of it is, is that he's gone in his prime, you know, 38 years old. That's, you know, we, we tend to see athletes in their peak and then they live the second half of their lives kind of <laughs> trying to recapture their glory or talk about their glory. And, and Clemente didn't have, he didn't have that available to him. He passed yeah. away. Major League Baseball made this decision right away to retire his number. Today, nobody can win a number. No, today on September 15th, which is Clemente Day, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, all the players wear number 21, his his number as as a tribute to him. So we could see his stature, you know, it's... it's Yeah, it's just no, absolutely, absolutely. By 1972, Roberto Clemente was an icon. I mean, you know, baseball Baseball was still a very popular sport. He was a four-time National League batting champion. He was a National League MVP. He was a two-time World Series champion. He was the MVP of the 71 World Series, I think. When the, year before, the, the year before. The year before he was – yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so he was he was a sports icon, and he transcended sports because of, you know, all of this humanitarian work that he did. So it was a terrible blow. Uh, you know, when Clemente died, 38 years old, past his prime as a baseball player, but he should have had the whole rest of his life, you know, 30, 40 years or more to to go, but tragically cut short by by, by this, this terrible accident, trying to do good in the world, trying to help innocent victims of an earthquake in, the, in Nicaragua. So, uh yeah. Should we should we salute? What a life! Yeah, I think so, Andy. I think that's a good note to to end on. His legacy lives. Mm -hmm. Say thank you, thank you, Mr. Clemente, for the the great sports moments, and above all, thank you for you know what a great man you were and the inspiration you provide to us as we as we seek to become the heroes, the hero of our own lives. So. Thanks very much, everybody. We'll be oh, we're looking we're looking for inspiration every week from great men and women. If you have any suggestions, you can write them into the Objective Standard Institute. The website is what objectivestandard.org. That's right. Dot org. Yep. yep. Robert right, at right objectivestandard.org. You can send it to me. Yep. Mm -hmm. There you go. Robert at objectivestandard.org. <laughs> if you have some suggestions, and we will be yeah. back next week with more inspiration from great men and women on the Hero Show.